Hello, welcome. My name is Paula Price. I'm with the People's Law School, and today's webinar is all about your privacy rights in British Columbia. We have four incredible speakers who are joining us today, Carrie Bennett, Mike Larson, Daniel Reed, and Jason Boywada. I will be introducing them more formally in just a few minutes. We would like to acknowledge that we are grateful to work on the unceded traditional ter territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Silvatooth nations whose peoples continue to live on and care for these lands. And we invite all of you to consider and reflect on where it is that you are joining us from today. We would also like to thank our funders, the Department of Justice Canada, the Law Foundation of British Columbia, and the Notary Foundation of British Columbia, whose financial support makes the production of these webinars possible. And finally, last but not least, we would love to welcome and thank our speakers. I will introduce them from left to right on your screen, starting with Carrie Bennett. Carrie, welcome. Carrie is a lawyer with the law firm DLA Piper in Vancouver. Carrie provides strategic advice and representation to public and private sector clients in all areas of privacy, access to information, and workplace law matters. She is recognized within the legal profession at the national level in terms in areas of privacy, data protection, and data security law. Welcome, Carrie. We have Daniel Reed. Daniel is also a lawyer. He is at the law firm of Harper Gray in Vancouver. And Daniel maintains a broad defamation, privacy, and insurance practice with particular experience in online defamation, breach of privacy, and professional negligence cases. He is a sought-after speaker on legal and technical, technological issues and has appeared on the Bill Good Show on local and national news. Welcome, Daniel. We have Mike Larson. Mike is the president of the BC Freedom of Information and Privacy Association, also known as FIPA. You'll be hearing quite a bit about FIPA today. It is a nonpartisan, nonprofit society dedicated to promoting and defending the freedom of information and privacy rights in Canada. And Mike is a faculty member and chair of the criminology department at Kwantlen Polytechnic University. Welcome, Mike. We are so delighted to have you here. And finally, last but not least, Jason Waiwata. Jason is the executive director of FIPA. He is also a certified information privacy professional Canada and a certified information privacy manager through the International Association of Privacy Professionals. Welcome, Jason. We are delighted to have you. And as you can tell, we have a fabulous panel for today's discussion. So thank you, everyone. And thank you, everyone, who's joined us today. So we're going to turn to our first question. And it is for you, Carrie, what does the right to privacy actually mean? And who decides what is protected? Thank you, Paula. And um, thank you very much for the introduction and to everyone at, at um, People's Law School. I'm very pleased to be part of the webinar today and part of this panel. Um, what does the right to privacy actually mean? The uh, people throw that question around a lot. Um, it's used in a lot of different it's used in a lot of different contexts um, there and there can be a lot of confusion about what that really means. Some people think it means um, um, a, a charter right. We we all are um, gen have a general familiarity with the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms. The charter doesn't specifically mention privacy, but it does afford um, certain protection under Section 7 and Section 8. Um, in terms of right to life, liberty, and security of the person, and the right to be secure against unreasonable search and seizure. Um, sometimes, sometimes those rights are, are conflated with the right to privacy. Um, in addition, in BC, we have um, a legislation called the Privacy Act, um, which allows people to bring a claim. Um, it's called a tort claim when they feel that they have suffered an invasion of privacy. Um, in other provinces, um, we would refer to that there's not necessarily a statute. Um, it would be judge-made law or common law, um, where you would potentially have the right to bring a claim if you feel that your privacy has been invaded. But what more commonly um, impacts people in their day-to-day, -day, the bulk of people in their everyday life, um, particularly in British Columbia, 
is, is not necessarily privacy, but rather the protection of their personal information, either under BC's Personal Information Protection Act in the private sector, or the Freedom of Information and Protection of Privacy Act in the public sector. And so um, whether you, um, if you are an employee and you're employed in the private sector, your employer has obligations um, under the private sector legislation. If you're employed in the public sector, your employer has obligations under the public sector legislation and so on. Generally, everyone who's operating in the province of BC, um, uh, whether we're looking at um, anyone who's collecting your personal information um, is probably required to comply with one of those pieces of, of legislation or um, if for some reason they're federally regulated in their operations in BC, they'll be required to comply with federal PIPEDA. So in summary, there's a lot of legislation that potentially applies to the collection of your personal information. Um, and and uh, you, you may have rights under one of those statutes. Beautiful. Thank you so much, Carrie. That's such a great answer. And you've set us up very nicely for our next question, which is for you, Jason. Um, what are some common everyday situations that engage your rights to privacy? Right. And I guess that's that's the main thing right now, because your personal information in a modern context is used in a variety of ways on a daily basis. Every time you're using one of these little handy handheld devices or even your smartwatch to pay for devices when you're checking out for coffee. Um, so, you know, every retail transaction that we conduct on a regular basis involves some exchange of personal information. Um, sometimes and, and within BC law, we know that the IP address um, for your computer is personal identifying information as well. Um, and another dynamic that can come in with this is just these types of meetings. Um, we know that in Zoom, for example, there were initial concerns about how that information was being transited uh, to servers through China and what that would lead to in terms of their access to the information discussions that were taking place here. So that leads to some of this current concern in a geopolitical context when, you know, we see the current discussions around TikTok and how people can go into these types of online platforms and protect their personal information appropriately and know how that is being protected. So we've got to make sure that we are aware of how information that is being transmitted over the internet and to various servers to be processed is protected and make informed decisions as consumers in terms of what we're willing to accept. Um, in, in the context of this meeting, I don't assume that we're going to be dealing with any confidential or classified information that needs to be protected. Um, so I have no problem using Zoom. But I would have a concern if Zoom was being used by a government agency and it was transiting through a foreign nation and what that would lead to. So there's those types of important consumer and, and everyday decisions that we have to make as individuals. And it's a complex environment and it evolves every day. So we've got to make sure that when we see the latest new app that's you know, being used quickly on the internet and blowing up on, on, in people's chats, um, that we're take a pause for just a second, a moment if possible, <laughs> and consider where is that information transiting? How is it being protected? And what is the personal information that I'm giving up when I use those platforms and when I say something on those platforms? Beautiful. Thank you so much, Jason. I think it really drives home the, the importance of a session like today's session to learn more about our privacy rights and, and what's happening with that information. Um, Jason, or Mike, this next question is for you. Um, what is FIPA and what role do they play? Thanks very much. Uh, and thanks for, for having us uh, with you today. Um, so FIPA is the BC Freedom of Information and Privacy Association. And we're a nonpartisan and nonprofit organization under the Societies Act uh, here in British Columbia. Um, we're, we're one of the only organizations in Canada that is specifically dedicated to information and privacy rights. And when I say information and privacy, um, legislation like BC's FIPA, the Freedom of Information Protection of Privacy Act, um, recognizes our right to access government records and also our rights to access our own personal information held by public bodies uh, and also a right to have our privacy protected by, by public bodies. And we also have, as others have mentioned, other legislation too. So BC FIPA works on all aspects of that really broad mandate. Um, we do so by engaging in well, public education activities is one part of our mandate. Uh, we participate in, in uh, fantastic events like this. We also organize many of our own uh, events, uh, webinars, uh, training sessions, modules. Um, 
we also engage in research. Um, and that's a really important aspect of this field, actually. As Jason mentioned, you know, this is a really a moving target. And I think uh, that my legal colleagues here will, will, will agree that uh, quite often practice is moving faster than legislation keeps up, uh, which means that there's always kind of an unknown quantity in terms of uh, where our privacy rights are standing right now. So organizations like FIPA and many other partners in the civil liberties field uh, engage in research to try and figure out, well, what's going on? What are the standards? How, how does BC in particular um, fit into the broader picture? Um, we engage in law reform and advocacy activities. So although we are we're nonpartisan, uh, it doesn't mean we're not political. We want to get involved in discussions about uh, privacy rights and law that impacts privacy rights. So uh, we're actively making submissions to committees. We're appearing before parliamentary committees, both federally and, and provincially, uh, uh, trying to push for changes and reforms to our laws that will strengthen privacy protections, strengthen individual access to information, and ultimately user control, right? Our own control over our personal information. Um, and I'll just I'll conclude by saying it's a, it's a member-driven organization, FIPA. So this is a bunch of people who have a passion for information and privacy rights. Uh, and if uh, you share that passion, then I, I, I warmly invite you to, uh, to check our website out uh, and see if you're interested in getting involved uh, with an organization like this. Beautiful. Thank you so much, Mike. And we will have links to the FIPA website um, and, and share that with our, with our guests as well. Daniel, this next question is for you, and it's about health records. So who has access to those records? And what if you don't want anybody else to see them? That, that's a great question. And, and one of the things that, uh, as Jason mentioned, is, is changing is uh, we have health information uh, and health records pretty much everywhere now. So um, really, it's going to depend on, on um, which organization you're talking about. There, there's different legislations, so different laws that apply to things like a private clinic, a dentist's office versus a hospital or a public body, which may have your health information. And then there's specific legislation that applies to government databases uh, like a Pharma Health, or sorry, PharmaNet, um, uh, Care Connect, laboratory information, and things like that. So depending on, on, on what type of health information you're dealing with, there may be different uh, legislation that applies. There's also the issue that we now have health information on our phones, many of us. So we have uh, things like our, if your watch tracks your sleep, you may have personal health information that you are signing over to an app. And, and unless you read the terms of services and services carefully, it may be that you are agreeing to that information being shared fairly broadly. So, you know, the, the, when you say health records, it, it the, there really are a couple of different places where that could be. And depending on where that is, there's different legislation that's going to apply. A general principle in, in British Columbia is for the most part, um, uh, health records are kept within a circle of care. So uh, the people who have access uh, and do access records are going to be people who need that in order to provide and, and give care. In terms of what if you don't want people to see them, there are some circumstances where uh, it is necessary for a practitioner to know that information. So an example would be if there's health complications, things like blood type or other things, people within the circle of care need to be aware of that. They need to be able uh, to, to access uh, that information in order to provide uh, care generally. So for the most part, it's a situation where uh, there are people who, who do have the right to access for, for legitimate reasons. There may be rare cases where there's a concern, for example, you know, if you know a friend or family member uh, works at a dental clinic that you're frequenting, where it may be worthwhile advising someone at the front desk to say, hold on a sec. And I know someone who works here would be more comfortable if, if they weren't included in that circle of care. So uh, a bit of a long answer, as many uh, legal things are, that it, it's complicated and it's going to depend what type of health information you're referring to, where it is, um, who has access to it. And certainly when it comes to things like our phones and smart devices that do track health information, you could conceivably have a, a wide body of, of, of parties that have access to that information, um, certainly depending on the terms of services that you agree to when you sign up for that service. Super. Thank you so much, Daniel. Um, Carrie, this next question is for you, and it's about the employment context. So what can a prospective employer access in running a background check on you? Can they ask for a criminal background check? And what other types of information can an, can an employer collect about you? Um, so this is a fact-based analysis. Um, the law provides that an employer um, needs to do an assessment of their, of their operations to consider 
um, what information may be necessary for the purpose of the position and uh, to determine um, what information, uh, whether it's a criminal background check um, or a credit check um, or other background information may be appropriate for the role. Um, once the employer does that analysis, then um, they would generally reach out to the employee and either obtain express written consent in most circumstances um, uh, or um, in some circumstances, um, oral or, or implied consent, but generally practice nowadays is to obtain express written consent before um, seeking um, uh, some form of background check and certainly for a criminal records check. Um, express written consent is the is the norm. Um, in terms of what other types of information an employer can collect about you, um, if we look at the private sector legislation as an example, an employer is permitted under private sector legislation to collect, use, and disclose the personal information that's reasonable for the purposes of establishing, managing, and terminating the employment relationship. Again, that's going to be a fact-based analysis. Um, but if we take a look at, you know, most employee relationships, they're going to need, um, you know, they're going to, they're at base level, they're going to need your SIN number so that they can pay you. Um, they're going to need um, um, some information uh, about you and your dependents to sign you up for benefit programs. They're going to, um, uh, they're going to potentially need um, information uh, about you um, in terms of if you make a request for accommodation, they there may be a need to obtain some medical information from you in order to support the accommodation request. Um, if you, um, uh, depending on the nature of the business operations, um, there may in certain circumstances be some types of monitoring in the workplace. But again, that's going to be specific, uh, fact specific to the business. Beautiful. Thank you so much, Carrie. Our next question is for Jason. And this is looking at it, the question of privacy more in relationship to a landlord tenant situation. So can a landlord require you to submit your bank re records before renting to you? So before writing to you, this is a pretty straightforward answer in a BC context, and the short answer is no. Um, but like anything in privacy, it unfortunately depends a lot on the context after that, uh, because while the uh, landlord is not entitled to receive that banking information prior to you becoming the renter, once you are renting from them, um, they may require that information in order to process payments and, and deal with other things. Um, there have been multiple guidance documents and information submitted through the Office of the Information and Privacy Commissioner here in BC. There was a full investiga investigative report that resulted in guidance documents that were last updated in 2019. And that goes through a lot of these dynamics that sort of outline what is and isn't acceptable in a landlord-tenant arrangement uh, from a privacy perspective. Um, you know, the, the key dynamic here is from the OIPC's own findings is the landlords tend to over collect information uh, based on the people that they reviewed and they spoke with. Um, but many individuals felt they had no choice but to provide sensitive personal information on a tendency application so they didn't lose out on a place to live. Um, so there is a power dynamic that sets in in some of these scenarios um, that sometimes mean that although the answer is no, um, you're left with very little other than legal recourse uh, to address these things. And as identified in the OIPC's own reports, investigations, um, the OIPC gets daily calls on this um, in terms of what citizen rights are. They're often made anonymously because people are concerned about this, and then they don't follow through with the complaints afterwards because the formal complaint process could indeed lead to possible repercussions afterwards. So that's some of the dynamics that are at play in this when we talk about privacy at in the real world on a daily basis in terms of some of these dynamics. Um, we'll always advise as much as possible that people maintain their privacy and if they're not comfortable sharing that banking information that they don't. Um, and because that is what they are entitled to within a rates-based process here in BC. Super, thank you so much, Jason. This next question is for Mike. Um, Mike, what am I agreeing to when I agree to privacy policies online? And what can I do to protect myself when using apps or buying things online? 
This is a big question. Um, you you can agree to a lot with this. Uh, it really does depend. One of the, the principle that kind of governs most of the private sector interactions we have with applications is a principle of consent. You know, it's supposed to be you know reasonable and informed consent. But you can be asked to consent as a condition of using an application uh, to the collection of information, often defined as something for a purpose of you know enhancing user experience, uh, which can really be quite broad in terms of the information that can be collected about you through your use of the app. And of course, it's not just in most cases, um, the use of the app itself and your interaction with it that's being uh, that's of interest or could be collected. It's also your other online activities, right? And so this has been uh, one of the, the significant challenges with, with privacy policies in, in Canada is that I may have a particular application I use for a limited range of things, but the, the terms I'm consenting to when I consent to it uh, actually Actually allow it to engage in things, let's say, like location tracking, uh, which in some instances may extend well beyond what I think is the actual use of the app. Um, so, but let's back up here. What what should we agree to? What are what are the principles that should guide this? Uh, well, it should be clear. It should be fair. It should be lawful, as as uh, you know, governed by the applicable legislation. Um, we should be able to clearly look to a privacy policy. Right, in terms in terms of the conditions that we're signing up to, that state what is collected and specifically what it's collected for. Right, the purpose and generally the idea here is that the collection must actually fit a um, a defined and clear purpose. So it's not just a carte blanche, uh, even if it is kind of broadly defined. Um, there's supposed to be a clear explanation as to why the information is being collected and indeed when it's being collected as well. Uh, and perhaps of interest to this, because some of these investigations do a great job of breaking down the applicable law. I might point people to a joint investigation by the Privacy Commissioner of Canada that looked at the Tim Hortons mobile app, uh, which many people downloaded. Uh, you know, it's a great way to order your coffee so that you don't have to actually wait in line. Very, and often kind of framed in terms of convenience, right? Download this, consent to these terms, and there's a convenience that you're, you're gaining here. And what ended up happening, of course, was that the, the app was actually tracking location data, granular location data, um, when you weren't using it, sometimes as many as several times a minute. And it was creating a fantastic uh, pool of information that could be used by Tim Hortons for, you know, thinking about where do their customers go? What do they do? Do they go to the competitors? But none of this was contemplated as being um, part of the original consent arrangement when people were actually asked to consent. And so the investigation found uh, that that was unlawful. So one thing I would say here is that we, we should be looking, instead of just kind of clicking, we should really be looking at those policies. And there is increasingly an emphasis on making them clear and transparent. It should be um, obvious. I would say we also should be wary of sharing data unnecessarily, right? So if there is a, do you consent to this? Well, if you don't have to, and if you don't really need to or want to use the service, then don't. Uh, and certainly you can you can dial down the amount of information that's collected and shared with some applications and some devices you're using. Um, definitely review and research policies. You can often find uh, just by typing in a web search for application X privacy policy, you'll find some good discussion about that. And you can follow up on that too. Uh, look for some of the guidelines that are available from uh, uh, organizations like the Office of the Information and Privacy Commissioner for British Columbia or the Privacy Commissioner of Canada. Um, and then in, in broader sense, right, what can I do to protect my data when using apps or buying things online? Um, it sounds old school, but passwords uh, don't use the same password for everything. Um, you know, switch up passwords. Uh, use strong passwords, right? Uh, and and have a good privacy manage or password management system to keep those things organized. You don't want to have the same password because a, a single breach is a single point of failure. And if it gets access to ten passwords, then you're in trouble. Um, and also take uh, take a look at your device settings, right? You'll have device settings on, let's say, a phone. Right, which speak to things like location tracking, which speak to things like the metadata that's embedded in things like images. So when you're taking a picture of the geolocation of where you are, uh, and also the um, settings that you'll see in your applications for things like cookies, right? You can switch them on, you can switch them off. Uh, there are more you know, significant steps you can take, like using a, a VPN, a uh, virtual private network or a router. Um, but I think those basic steps are, are really important. The key is, is to really look into the privacy policies, right? And if they're unclear, I think it's probably a sign. Super. Thank you so much, Mike. And I love how you made that so specific. And I think I'm probably not the only one thinking about her passwords or <laughs> their passwords today and how to make them stronger. Um, this next question is for you, Daniel. Can a stranger take a photo or video of me in a public place? Yeah, that's such a fantastic question. And it really depends on a lot of factors. So Generally speaking, across all of the privacy legislation, there's this idea that you have a reasonable expectation of privacy. 
And just because someone's in a public place doesn't mean they lose that expectation. An example would be if I'm sunbathing in my backyard, I might be okay. It might be reasonable that my neighbors see me, but I have an expectation that that's going to be it. I wouldn't be comfortable with someone flying a drone overhead, taking pictures of me, uploading it on YouTube and tagging me. So uh, it really does depend on the circumstances. And there, there's a wide variety of laws that could potentially apply. You have, uh, as was mentioned earlier, the Privacy Act, which gives someone the right to uh, sue for an uh, an, uh, a violation of, of privacy. That could certainly be the case if, if a video is taken in a, in a public space and uploaded online. And there's been a number of cases where people have successfully sued for videos taken in a public place or photos taken in a public place that are published in a way outside of their consent. There also is, and we haven't talked about this yet, certain provisions of the criminal code that potentially could apply. There, there's a section dealing with voyeurism, which is where photos are taken. Uh, uh, you know, the, the typical example is, is the, the upskirt photo or, or violating uh, photos that are taken to people. And that can apply even in a public space. So uh, it is something where um, just because you're in a public space doesn't mean you don't have uh, an expectation of privacy still. And it may be circumstances where um, your, your reasonable expectation of privacy could be violated by someone taking your photo or video of you and certainly someone using it subsequently in a way uh, that you don't consent to or you're not comfortable with. So, so again, it is very fact specific, but there no longer is this idea that just because you step out of the house, it's fair game and you don't have a right to privacy. You can maintain an expectation of privacy even when you're in a public place. Super, thank you so much, Daniel. Carrie, this next question is for you. Um, when is it okay for an employer to install video surveillance or other types of surveillance in the workplace? What about remote monitoring? Um, so again, this comes down to a fact-based analysis um, uh, where the, the employer does need to um, consider um, the type of operations that they have and what is and what is necessary for their operations. I'll give you an example. Um, there may be um, um, in a safety sensitive, big machinery, um, manufacturing type of operation, cameras may be critical to the production process. Um, cameras may be necessary for um, uh, actually ensuring safety and the best way of, um, of making sure that um, the production is efficient and that the processes are safe. Um, in that case, then um, video surveillance is reasonable. There's a lot of case law that says that installing video surveillance, installing video cameras in areas that um, an employee would consider to be private is not appropriate. For example, in lane, in change rooms or lunch rooms um, or, or other locations where an employee would, would maintain that expectation of privacy. Um, in this area of in this time of remote work, everybody's very, very interested about um, um, employer monitoring in the remote workplace. Again, this is this is really fact specific. Um, we do need to think about the types of of businesses where um, there has typically been um, monitoring where it has been appropriate, for example, um, call centers have, have, and they may be fully remote now. Um, people may be calling, speaking to you from their basement. Um, um, but in um, those calls have traditionally been recorded for quality assurance purposes and um, to, and uh, it, it may be perfectly reasonable for those calls to continue to be recorded. Um, there are all kinds of new fancy ways for the um, employer to monitor employees um, in terms of their activities on, on their computers. Some of those may be highly invasive and not appropriate for the particular tasks that the employees are performing. So the employer has an obligation to assess the position, assess the role, assess what is reasonable and to choose something that is the least privacy invasive in the appropriate circumstances. Super, thank you so much, Carrie. This next question is for Mike. Mike, can law enforcement monitor my whereabouts? Can they ask to see my phone? 
another another big question. Um, I mean, <laughs> to a certain extent, they can ask for anything. Um, and the question I think maybe is is um, is it is it reasonable to expect you to comply, or do you have to comply with uh, with a, a request in those situations? So um, I'll, I'll take the second part first. Can law enforcement ask to see your phone? First thing I want to do is note that there's different kind of categories of organizations here, right? So I'll speak generally to police powers in Canada and police organizations, but I want to put the caveat in that our rights are different when we come to the border. Right when you're crossing the border, uh, the the request to uh, uh, see your phone to go through your phone uh, it has a much stronger footing. Right, so th th there's much more discretion on the, on the part of let's say Canada Border Services Agency than there would be on the part of let's say RCMP uh, here where I live in in Surrey. Um, Police may conduct a search of a cell phone, right? And, and they may do so in a couple of different instances. And, and the case law on this that I would refer to would be the uh, Supreme Court case in Fearon from 2014, uh, which really sets this out, right? So first off, if there's a warrant, can police ask to see your phone? Uh, if they have a warrant, absolutely. It's not really an ask at that point, right? They can obtain the phone as evidence if that is part of a warrant process there. Um, they can also uh, search a phone with permission. And this can be a challenging situation because a police officer could say, you know, can I see your phone? Um, absent a warrant, absent an arrest, which I'll get to in a second, you don't have to comply with that. But there is a power dynamic there, right, that can make people some, you know, feel uh, challenged to say, no, I'm going to assert my right, right? I'm not going to, to uh, provide my phone. But with permission, um, then police can take a look at a phone. Uh, and then finally, without permission, as part of a search, which is incident to a lawful arrest, Right? If someone is arrested lawfully, uh, then uh, they can be searched, uh, and part of that search can involve a phone. But it's a bit more complicated than that because simply arresting someone lawfully doesn't mean that police can uh, you know, go through their entire phone. Um, there, there are some limitations to this. The arrest has to be lawful. Um, the search has to be truly incidental to the arrest in this case, and the nature of the search has to be based on, on, the, on the purpose, of the objectives that are being obtained. So, for example, there's information on my phone that deals with all aspects of my life. Uh, and not all of that would be fair game for a search, even if I was lawfully arrested. There has to be a specific objective, perhaps, for example, uh, text messages that relate to the, the, you know, the purpose for which I was arrested, the reason, right, to, to an ongoing investigation, uh, images that may pertain to, you know, things that I've just recently done, those kinds of things, much more specific. Uh, and then police are also obliged to document the, the what and the how of the search. So there is a documentary record, which is very important, of course, uh, if and when any of this information goes before uh, a court and it becomes evidentiary in that sense. Um, the search really also has to be, you know, for the purpose of preserving evidence, uh, for protecting the public. Uh, so there, there are some very specific reasons that, that kind of govern this. Um, and so the short answer is that it's not a carte blanche uh, right to, to search a phone. Um, now, the other question, right, can law enforcement monitor our whereabouts. Um, that is, again, something where a warrant can allow police officers to conduct an investigation, which might include the monitoring of a location, might include the tracking of individuals uh, who are of interest. Uh, and so, yes, with a warrant, that's entirely possible. Uh, generally speaking, it's not lawful for police officers to simply engage in mass suspicionless surveillance and tracking of the public, including uh, you and me. Uh, that would be unlawful. There have been some really interesting cases um, that have uh, come up around technologies like IMSI catchers, right, which ping cell phones and can create records of, you know, basically it spoofs a cell phone tower, it tells your phone, hey, I'm a cell phone tower, connect with me. And lots of information about who you are uh, is connected to your phone, right? Your, your uh, IMSI number and all those kinds of things. So there have been some, some challenges around that. And I think without getting into too much about the future of this, perhaps we'll have time later, um, a, a, a looming challenge on the horizon when it comes to this aspect of, of law and rights in Canada is the use by police organizations of third-party applications that provide a lot of very granular, detailed information about people, including things that involve facial recognition technology, uh, web scraping applications that provide really specific information. And there you get into this weird blurring of public and private sector laws, uh, the use of off-the-shelf technologies uh, that can, I think, there's been some creative misuses of, of these technologies by police organizations in Canada already, and, and we're looking to tighten laws up so it doesn't happen more in the future. Uh, but as a short answer, um, suspicionless monitoring of, of whereabouts of individuals, no, not lawful. Beautiful. Thank you so much, Mike. This next question is for Jason. Um, Jason, what are some signs that you've had your identity stolen? And if that happens, what can you do about it? 
So I, I think the key thing here is to make sure we strike that balance between forgetfulness at times, um, uh, conspiracy, and and what can actually happen. And and you know those are important distinctions to draw on this. Um, identity theft happens. And it's possible that someone can steal your identity because they've gained access to your cell phone or they've gained access to your email account or your password's been shared online and they've been able to get your SIN number and all these other things. So the, the key thing to watch for, and, and there are multiple lists that go into all sorts of different dynamics, um, but the, the key thing is your credit report doesn't seem accurate. Uh, there seems to be suspicious activity on your credit or bank statements, expenses you're not familiar with. You're getting unexpected physical mail and not just, um, uh, not just the regular uh, flyers in the mail, but addressed mail to you that you don't expect to receive because someone seems to have received your mailing address from something you don't remember signing up to. Uh, missing physical mail. Uh, someone taking your packages or your mail uh, can contribute to um, your identity being stolen. Um, identification documents being lost or stolen, that's automatically a flag that you are at greater risk for having your identity stolen. Uh, suspicious phone calls and, and voicemails, again, um, that can give you pause that someone else is using your identity to communicate with other people, and those people are then trying to reach that person using other mechanisms. Uh, and that also leads to the special emails and text messages that might be part of that. Uh, unfamiliar SMS verification codes. We know that when we reset our passwords, we have these mechanisms in order to receive that verification code. And if we start seeing those popping up without us initiating that initial interaction, that gives us pause to think, wait a second, why did I just get that? I didn't prompt for a reset. And is someone trying to fish to get my password right now as well by going to a spoof site that is, you know, presenting itself as Microsoft when it's really somebody else trying to gain my personal information. Um, and again, when you're scanning and logging into manage my Google account or manage my Microsoft accounts or, or iTunes accounts, those types of things, um, if you start seeing unfamiliar devices that have access to your online accounts, um, that's an automatic flag as well. And that's why it's important to go in, check those settings and make sure that, wait a second, I got rid of that cell phone five years ago. Why do I still have it listed on my device? or as having access to my accounts. I should make sure I delete that. Um, the key thing with this is that if you do feel that you've become a victim, um, you know, you can start taking actions with the appropriate uh, services to try and get that reset. Uh, but again, as it becomes more serious, if they gain access to your social insurance number or other things, um, then it becomes a matter of reporting the incident uh, to the local police if the matter is, uh, you know, involved in a theft or a crime, reporting the incident to the Canadian Anti-Fraud uh, Centre, um, if the matter involves a scam or a fraud, uh, if there's phishing involved, those types of dynamics, um, advising your bank and credit card companies and requesting new bank or credit card information uh, with identifiers on them, if that is relevant, uh, and reporting any missing identification documents as soon as you recognize that they're missing. Um, it's, it's really important that when we're considering these things that criminal activity isn't just from male actors, isn't just focused on the big spenders um, and, and trying to target BC Public Health or the local hospital or the association down the road. Um, it is increasingly one of those dynamics where this technology to scan your phone or your credit cards is available to male actors um, and, and possible for them to get that by sitting close to where you're scanning your entry card to get into work, those types of things. So I've been part of different boards where we had a budget of $50,000 and someone was trying to fish our accounts because someone else has had their uh, email breached. So really important to recognize that this can happen, that it happens more frequently than we care to admit because we've had poor passwords um, or, or other factors. And that's also why it's really important to always use dual authentication as much as possible um, in order to try and make sure that you've got that second point of contact before you lose your password uh, for these types of services. Super, thank you so much, Jason. Um, we have one last prepared question and then we'll turn to the live questions. I see we've got a number of them in the Q&A field. And this question is for you, Daniel. What recourse do you have if your rights have been breached? Thanks, Paula. Uh, and, and it's one of those, those answers that really depends on the circumstances of the breach. Um, you know, one of the great difficulties we have today is uh, information and personal information can, can cross borders so easily. So it can be really, really tricky to, to have find a recourse or have a recourse where uh, you've got an American site, for example, that's hosting personal information because 
uh, the, the resources that were mentioned earlier, things like the provincial or, or federal privacy commissioners may not necessarily be in a position to assist. So uh, the first thing you can do uh, in terms of if you're concerned you have your, your rights, rights uh, reached is look to the privacy commissioner uh, that, that governs the issue. So if it's a federal jurisdiction or if it's cross-border, it would be the federal privacy commissioner. If it's uh, provincial, it'd be the British Columbia privacy commissioner. And, and the privacy commissioners are, are just an incredible resource generally. They have an, a, a really good overview of common legal questions that come up guidelines for, for certain uh, uh, economic sectors and areas, and, and, and they also uh, have the ability uh, to handle complaints. So it may be a situation where it's appropriate to complain to the privacy commissioner uh, indicating that the rights have been breached. Um, generally speaking, um, and, and there's the, some abilities to impose fines, particularly at the federal level, um, but generally speaking, the privacy commissioners um, are not an approach that are, is going to result in compensation. So it would result in a change going forward with that organization, but it's not something that would result in, in you being compensated. There is the ability, as Carrie mentioned, to sue under the Privacy Act for a, a it's considered a tort, if uh, someone violates your privacy without lawful excuse. And um, although though that, that the act itself is relatively straightforward, it can be quite, quite tricky and quite expensive. Uh, typically speaking, uh, damages in privacy cases in Canada have traditionally been quite low. And under the Privacy Act in British Columbia, um, those claims can only be brought in the British Columbia Supreme Court. So they can't be brought in small claims. It requires suing at the higher level, which typically uh, handles cases of, of a higher monetary amount. So it, it can be a bit of a catch-22 where there's a privacy violation and, and, and it may not be economical or practical to take that step uh, of, of actually commencing a lawsuit and, and, and it can get even trickier, as I said, where you have uh, other jurisdictions, particularly in the United States, uh, involved in the privacy breach. So um, the short answer is, is look to the privacy commissioners as a starting point. They're just an incredible, overwhelming resource. It may be something where it's appropriate to reach out to a lawyer and, and make those inquiries and get legal advice as to whether there's a viable uh, claim. And in some circumstances, uh, a lot of breaches in this day and age are, are, are simply accidental. Um, it may be something where it's possible to have a, a constructive dialogue with the organization or individual directly and say, hey, by the you know, I, I saw that you put up security cameras here in the hallway, and I, I, I'm just wondering if there's a way we can do this that addresses those concerns. That, that doesn't point straight you know, uh, into my bathroom window or something along those lines. Um, so it is something where, where there's guidance that's available, um, there, there's potentially an opportunity for dialogue, and in some cases, there may be the ability to, to pursue legal action in respect of a breach of privacy. Super, thank you so much. Um, Daniel, while we have you, um, one of the, um, I've now turned to some of the live questions, and there's one here that I think is very relevant for you. Um, how can a person access their health records if they don't have a doctor or a nurse practitioner? And does the same person have the right to, co to a copy of the records from any physician, et cetera, that one sees? That, that's a fantastic question. So um, typically speaking, you do have the right to reach out to the clinic you go to, a healthcare practitioner who has your records, and to request a copy. Um, however, uh, they do have the right to charge reasonable fees for, for copying in most circumstances. So it is something where um, in most cases you should be able to reach out if it's a walk-in clinic to that walk-in clinic, um, you know, if, it, if it's a hospital to that hospital and say, I'd like a copy of my records. Um, but, but again, they do have that ability to say, sure, here is the photocopying fee. There are some exceptions to that. So there are circumstances where, where healthcare providers can say, um, I am not going to provide your records. Those are, are limited and those are set out by the, the governing health professions and, and, and by the, uh, the regulatory bodies. So generally speaking, as a principle, you do have the right to request access and a copy of your records. Uh, it may be a situation where, where that does come at, a, and it can't be an exorbitant or, or, or unreasonable fee, but it can be a situation where they say, sure, I'll provide you it, but it's going to be on a USB stick. And th this is the fee that's going to cost us to put those records there. Beautiful. Thank you so much, Daniel. Carrie, I'm going to turn this next question to you and, and see if it's appropriate for you or another speaker. Um, are there privacy laws governing the taking of videos or photos of public events, such as open air concerts or street marches or rallies that are held in public spaces? Um, so those would, uh, yes. So um, depending on who is hosting the event, um, potentially uh, the private sector legislation or public sector legislation 
would apply. So for example, um, if I am a private event coordinator um, and I'm holding an event uh, in the province of British Columbia, I would be governed by BC's PIPA. Um, but again, um, if I'm in an open air, if you're having an open air concert, um, um, we would be looking at uh, the standard of reasonableness. So uh, when we're looking at information that's collected, used and disclosed. Um, so as Daniel said previously, you don't give up your privacy rights. You don't give up your privacy rights just because you're outside. Um, um, but, um, and that organizer would have an obligation to protect privacy. But I, I'm, I would be curious about the, um, the end of the question about the open air concert, so. Thank and I'll, I'll I'll jump in on that point. Um, there there's a number of of circumstances. So PIPA is that law that applies to the private sector, and, and there are specific exceptions in PIPA in Section 12 where it talks about how organizations can collect personal information without someone's consent. One of the ones that's specifically in there is uh, the personal information is collected by observation at a performance, a sport meet, or a similar event at which the individual voluntarily appears or that is open to the public. So, so there's a specific um, provision within PIPA that deals with collecting personal information and using personal information without consent. That said, there still may be circumstances where that personal information is subsequently used in a way that's unreasonable or, or violates someone's reasonable expectation of privacy. So uh, it is something where there is a specific provision of PIPA that, that does apply. Um, but that doesn't, again, necessarily mean that you lose all your privacy rights because you could still have the Privacy Act applying, or it could be something that doesn't fall within that, that, that uh, specific exception that's spelled out in the legislation. Thank you so much. Um, Mike, this next question is for you. And it really is, um, who is allowed to ask for your social insurance number? Um. So generally speaking, your social insurance number should be should be restricted. Um, one of the most restricted pieces of information about you. It's a highly sensitive piece of personal information, um, typically in the context of employment, right? So typically in a situation in which there's a requirement for purposes of payment, for taxation, um, for, for there to be that information, and it has to be, um, you know, really carefully managed too. There are some weird situations in which um, policies actually... I'll give you an example of a situation that really is a borderline one for me. I, I teach at a university, public institution. Uh, we have an honorarium policy when we have guest speakers come in sometimes to offer something as small as a $25 honorarium or $50 honorarium. And the university's policy is, is that they, they would like uh, us to request a social insurance number from a person in, in that situation for purposes of an audit trail, for purposes of, uh, of processing that payment. Um, and that get, to me, that, that, get, and that wasn't always the case, right, that that was required. It gets into a really gray area where you're, you're collecting something quite sensitive for something that is, you know, relatively minor. Uh, um, and you also see requests for social insurance when it comes to things like identity checks at banks, um, situations like this, because it is a, a piece of ID that is, is recognized in that situation. So I would say my general advice on this without saying, you know, here are the four circumstances in which it can be done. Ask why. Ask if it's a requirement ask why I've been in a situation before actually with with FIPA uh, you know in the context of banking where you know um, looking to add someone to an account for example and they would say let's can I have your social insurance number and we ask why and well, it's just we'd, we'd like it you know it's for verification do you do you need it lawfully no okay well then no and and that can work you know in, in some cases right it, it, depending on the context so I think ask questions beautiful Thank you so much, Mike. And and if any of the other speakers have comments, please feel free to ask. I'm just directing traffic, Jason. Well, well, one of the things I'd like to add on on to what Mike said there is this comes back to, in a lot of instances here, uh, the people that are asking for the information are as unclear about their privacy obligations in some cases as the people that are giving up their personal information, and and it's important to remember that. Um, you know, we all want to have our personal privacy and personal information protected. Um, but when we are collecting that, 
uh, what's been identified is that those organizations that are collecting it don't always place the same protections on that information that they would expect from the organization they've given their own personal information to. And so it's important that if you're in those types of power situations where you're collecting that information, that you start to ask yourself, well, would I feel comfortable giving my SIN for that same type of dynamic and collection? And you've got all of the other legal dynamics in terms of just making sure that you're meeting you know, reasonableness and, and proportionality and all these other concepts. But is it something that I need in order to conduct that? Uh, what is the purpose for that collection is really important to get into. And would I feel comfortable if I was on the reverse end of having to give that information to the organization that was requesting it? Thank you so much, Jason. And another question that might be um, one for you. Uh, a lot of strata corporations have website portals, whether they are self-managed or through a management company. Personal information is stored on these portals. Is there an issue under PIPA if these portals are stored outside of Canada? Well, in a current context, uh, BC got rid of the requirement for uh, the public bodies to host data in Canada. So we've had that change in the, in the British Columbia laws. Uh, there's Again, if the data is encrypted in transit and rest, uh, it should be protected appropriately that way. And if it's managed um, through a privacy management program by the organization that is using it uh, and collecting it for purpose, then there shouldn't be a concern there. Um, but again, we get into this dynamic of um, are all of those checks in place? And that's where the privacy management programs by um, public bodies and private bodies are so important because as a consumer, we need to be able to trust what is happening with our information when we're giving it. And the only way we can do that is by reviewing the material that is available and making sure that they are following what they say they're doing. Uh, so, you know, they always say in privacy, it's about trusting and verifying. So we trust that an organization when they're collecting it is, um, it needs that personal information and we need to verify that by gaining access to that privacy management program and having those questions answered if we pose them to the organization. That's why every organization is supposed to have a privacy officer that answers those questions when somebody poses it to them. I think that's the, that would be the, the most important factor there. Um, there are lots of organizations, you know, the, in, in Gmail that we're using on a regular basis that has information and data servers internationally now in a modern context. Um, so the data residency is less of a concern in the current context, as long as the protection is there. Super, thank you so much, Jason. Um, this next question, and thank you everybody who submitted questions. These are really excellent questions. Um, I'm gonna turn this one over to Daniel um, and it's a bit of a long question. So, um, but I, I think you're going to, um, I think it's a good one. It's got lots of upvotes. We filmed the neighbor who was causing nuisance and tampering with our property. The video was done from inside in the room behind the window. From our window, we were able to see the neighbor's backyard. When we reported the, to the strata about the nuisance, they asked if we had proof or evidence. We presented the video of the neighbor causing the nuisance. Um, and instead of stopping at the neighbor, the strata accused us um, of invading privacy of the neighbor and ordered us to stop filming the neighbor. The neighbor keeps causing the nuisance. They're spraying us from the garden hose, throwing items at the window to cause a disturbance. The strata supports the neighbor and um, as a council member, as their friend, can we use videos in court? Um, they've started to bring kids and teach them to throw items at our window. Can we use evidence um, recording the children who deliberately caused nuisance? And I gather this has happened since about 2020. Well, and, and that's a great question, and, and and it's a little bit complicated because we're dealing with with potentially a very specific situation. But I can talk about rather than sort of legal advice on a specific situation, some general principles that apply. So, um, it, it's that reasonable expectation of privacy circumstance again. It is it is allowable, permissible to videotape people if you have a reasonable uh, reason for doing it. And, and that can include for the purposes of reporting to law enforcement, for court proceedings and things like that. Um, and, and that's something that there, there's, and I know there's specific guidance from, from the Office of Information and Privacy Commissioner about the use of security cameras. Um, and, and often it comes down to setting up security cameras in a way that captures that legitimate purpose. So captures you know, instances where, where things are being thrown or left or, or, or captures your proper, property boundary but doesn't point through the bathroom window or, or the window of the neighbor. So, so it is that balance, um, generally speaking though, and, and people do, I mean, we all have a video camera on us all the time, 
you do have the ability to, to take photos and recordings in public, it's always a question of, in doing so, are you violating someone's reasonable expectation of privacy? Often that will turn on use. So, so using it for the purposes of court or for the purposes of a strata strat strat dispute is something that's fundamentally different than using it, putting it up on, on YouTube and saying, you know, my jerk neighbor um, and identifying them by name. So really as a fact specific thing, there is no prohibition on using uh, video recordings, audio recordings or things like that in court. That said, it, it can give rise to, to a potential privacy claim if it, if it exceeds what's reasonable in the circumstances. And I, and I do know that the Office of the Information and Privacy Commissioner here in BC has put out specific uh, guidance, recommendations, and overview of security cameras, because that is one of the biggest issues that comes up is a security cameras, particularly in a strata context. Um, yeah, so hopefully that helps. And, and it is something where um, for specific answers, you know, you, you may want to seek legal advice. Thank you so much. Thank you again. Uh, thank you, Mike. Thank you, Jason. Thank you, Daniel. Thank you, Carrie, who's no longer with us. And thank you to everybody who joined us here today. It has been such a rich and wonderful discussion and such a pleasure to, to be here with you all today. So with that, we are going to sign off and thank you again for being here and um, wishing you all uh, a fabulous week.